Hello, my name is Sam Felton. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration. Now, before I hand over to Liz, uh, who will be taking you through the Real Food Lifestyle course, uh, I just wanted to mention that in addition to providing this course for free, we also run an online weekly lifestyle support group you can join as well. Uh, simply go to our website at www.phcuk.org forward slash support and you can sign up right there. Also on the website, you can find lots of free resources and projects that you can get involved in, such as Real Food Runners or even the Ambassadors Programme as well. Uh, and if you find any of our content valuable whatsoever, uh, please, please, please do consider donating what you can or even regularly contributing to the charity by becoming an annual member. Now, without further ado, let me hand you over to Liz. Hello, and welcome to this course on the Real Food Lifestyle. Just a quick note before we begin, it's important that I give you a disclaimer. The information contained within this course is just that. It's information and not medical advice. That said, the course is based on concrete scientific evidence and real life results. And we continually follow the most up to date research and guidance from scientists and medical professionals. This course has been approved by the trustees of the Public Health Collaboration, which is a charity set up by doctors, dietitians, and other specialists to improve health and well-being and to deal with the growing epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. This course aims to help people improve their life through lifestyle changes. It's important that if you have any existing medical conditions, particularly if you're on any medication, that you consult your own doctor before making any lifestyle changes. So in today's session, I will tell you a little bit about my own story and then give you a brief introduction to the course. We'll talk about setting goals and about sugar and how it affects blood glucose. We'll then go on to look at what a real food lifestyle means and how to make healthy choices at breakfast. This was me in summer 2017. I weighed 14 stone two, which is 198 pounds or 90 kilos. And not long after the photograph was taken, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes with an HbA1c of 68. Some of you will know what that means. And for those that don't, we'll be taking talking more about it later. Bottom line, it's not great. And this is me now, having put my diabetes in full remission, my HbA1c is now 34, which is totally non-diabetic. I've lost four stone in weight, gone down four dress sizes, and come off most of the medications I'd been on for over 25 years. My HbA1c went into remission after just three months. And how did I do this? By changing what I eat and switching to a real food, low carb lifestyle. Over the course of the next few sessions, we're going to go into more detail about what a low carb lifestyle is, how and why it works and why traditional diets often fail. So who's this course for? Although many of you may be diabetic, this course is designed for anyone who wants to lose weight or improve their overall health. The COVID pandemic has shown us how important it is to be healthy and not overweight. Low carb and a real food lifestyle can also help with lots of other conditions such as arthritis, IBS, even things like MS, migraines and various mental health conditions. The course aims to help you improve blood glucose markers and other health markers like cholesterol and blood pressure, to help you lose weight and to feel better overall by introducing you to and helping you to adopt a low carb real food lifestyle. Note that we don't call this a diet. It's not a short term fix. How often do we fail with tradition, often low fat diets? How often have you lost weight only to pile it back on again? I know I did. I was overweight for my entire life, despite trying on numerous occasions to lose weight, going to Weight Watchers, losing a stone or even two, but then slipping back into the old ways and seeing the weight creep back on. This, on the other hand, is a lifestyle change. You may find it challenging to begin with, but I'm sure that once you've made the changes, you won't want to go back. I know I'll never return to eating the way I used to. As you progress over the following weeks, you may need to check with your GP or diabetes nurse, because if you're on any medications, they may need to be altered. 
To start with, it's a good idea to have a record of your starting position. If you've had a recent blood test, say within the last six months, then you can use those as your baseline. If you've not had recent tests, you could request them from your own doctor. It's a good idea to make a note of your weight. And if you have your own blood pressure monitor, your blood pressure. Blood pressure monitors are generally inexpensive. In the UK, you can get them for about £20. And it can be a good idea to check at regular intervals. If you don't know what your recent blood results are, then you can ask for them. Just ring the surgery and ask them. Or if you're in the UK, you may have an NHS login that gives you direct access to your results. There's a progress sheet available in the accompanying resources for this course. You can write all the numbers in that you can. We've included various measurements if you want to keep a record of them all, but your waist measurement is the most important as this indicates the level of, uh, level of visceral fat you may have. And as we'll see, that's an extremely important measure. Let's take a minute to reflect about what brings you here today. What are your personal goals? Is it to lose weight, perhaps for a special event, or just to feel better? Perhaps you want to improve control of your diabetes or like me, put it in complete remission if possible. Or do you want to run around with the grandchildren? Maybe you want to improve your mental health and feel more positive about life. When I started, I wanted to put my diabetes in remission. And once I'd realized that it was achievable and that I was losing weight quite rapidly, I decided I also wanted to lose three stone before my daughter came home for Christmas so I could surprise her with a new mum. And that became my new goal. So remember that your goals may shift over time. You may start with one goal, and as you get close to that, you may reassess and create a new goal. Think about how you feel now and what you could feel like in a month's time or three months' time or a year from now. You can pause the video for a minute and think for a moment about what it is you want to achieve and then write it down. This way you can monitor your progress as you go forward. Here are some common breakfasts that we're probably all familiar with. Thinking about an average day, what do you usually have for breakfast? Here, as I say, we have some of the usual ones, cereal or porridge, toast and toppings, yogurt with fruit and granola, eggs with sausages or bacon, beans on toast, a banana, fruit juice or a smoothie. These are common for, to many of us wherever we are in the world as well. Putting aside for the food for the moment, though, I presume most of you have tea or coffee in the morning as well. If you're diabetic or you've tried to lose weight, you may have given up having sugar in your tea and coffee. And why have you done that? Probably because you've been told you should give up sugar if you're overweight or diabetic. This is because when you eat sugar, it digests down into glucose, which increases blood glucose levels. And too much glucose in the blood can eventually lead to type 2 diabetes. So if your doctor or nurse is worried about your blood glucose levels, they will certainly have suggested you give up sugar. But suppose I now tell you that many of the things you may be eating for breakfast have the same effect on your blood and your blood glucose levels as the sugar you put or used to put in your tea and coffee. This chart is one of several developed by Dr. David Unwin, who's an award-winning GP in the north of England to show how common foods affect our blood glucose levels. If we look at brown bread, for example, we can see that just one slice from a small wholemeal loaf is the equivalent of eating nearly three and a half teaspoonfuls of sugar. And if you have a standard sized loaf, that will be more like four and a half teaspoons. And a glass of apple juice or orange juice is the equivalent of nearly nine teaspoonfuls of sugar. Cornflakes, often considered a healthy option, yet one serving has the same effect on your blood glucose as nearly eight and a half teaspoons of sugar. Even a small portion of bran flakes produces the equivalent of almost five teaspoonfuls of sugar. And this isn't because they necessarily contain sugar. Indeed, many cereals like bran flakes tell you on the front of the packet quite clearly that they don't contain sugar. But they are carbohydrates and all carbohydrates turn into glucose in just the same way as sugar does. This is sim a simple drawing of an iceberg, which represents all the things that digest down into glucose. Above the water level, as you can see, is just the tip of the iceberg with things like sugar and the obvious things like cakes and biscuits that we all know we shouldn't have. 
But it's not just the sugar and the sugary items. All carbohydrates are broken down into glucose by the body. Things like honey. Unfortunately, it doesn't make any difference that it's natural. Your body can't tell the difference. It's all glucose. Syrups like agave or maple syrup, fruit juices, but perhaps also, um, perhaps more surprisingly, things like pasta, bread, cereals, rice and potatoes, which we don't necessarily associate with being sweet or sugary at all. For instance, suppose you have a nice stew in the winter and you have boiled potatoes with it. How many spoonfuls of sugar do you think the potatoes might be equivalent to? Have a little think about it for a moment. Well, the answer is nine. And what about if you had a curry or a chili and some rice with it? Do you think that rice might be better? How much sugar do you think the rice would be equivalent to? More? Less? About the same? What do you think? Well, the answer is 10. If you have those ready to eat packs of rice that you heat in the microwave, those are 125 grams a portion, that is half a bag, which has the same effect as eating eight teaspoonfuls of sugar. But let's turn to something which we know is more healthy. What about a banana? We all know fruit is good for us, but how much sugar do you think one banana might be equivalent to? Well, one average banana, not a giant one, and certainly not three, as in the photograph, is equivalent to six cubes or spoonfuls of sugar. Modern bananas have been bred to be very sweet and as such are really best avoided. Dr. Unwin calls them nature's candy hanging off a tree, just ready for you to grab. So now we so know some of the things to avoid, the foods that break down into glucose in our bodies, the question is, what can we eat? And the answer is, lots of things. How does this look? Do you like strawberries, eggs, nuts, roast beef, salmon, cheese, whole load of foods that are perfectly healthy for us to eat? If we take a quick look at the list, we have meat, preferably unprocessed, um, though some of the processed ones where they're minimally processed, sort of traditionally cured meats uh, are like salamis um, are okay. But otherwise, any ordinary meat, be it beef, chicken, pork, lamb, turkey, I don't know, venison, um, especially the fattier cuts. Fish, all fish, especially oily fish like mackerel, salmon and sardines, because these are rich in anti-inflammatory omega-3 fats, so are really good for us. Eggs in any form you like, omelettes, boiled, poached, fried, whatever. Cheese, preferably hard cheeses, though some soft cheeses are fine as well. You really need to look at the packets, but hard cheeses are almost always very low in carbohydrates and they're a good source of protein. Full fat dairy, full fat yogurt, thick cream, butter, ghee. Ghee, of course, is clarified butter. Oils, coconut oil and olive oil. Nuts and seeds, especially macadamias, pecans, almonds, brazils. Not peanuts and cashew nuts, which are both very high in carbohydrates. Vegetables, especially the green and leafy ones, and those generally that grow above ground. Go easy on the uh, ones that grow underground, the root vegetables, because these are the starchy ones. Some fruit is fine too, things like the red berries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, not the tropical fruits like banana and pineapple. We all know sugar needs fruit to ripen, um, even in colder climes, we only get a very short fruit season and only certain fruits. Whereas in the tropics, things like bananas and pineapples have an awful lot of sun for very many hours of the year um, and therefore develop a lot more sugar within them. Dark chocolate, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear, is also fine. Anything preferably 85% cocoa content or above. If you find that challenging to begin with, then maybe try going from your milk chocolate that maybe you have now to something like 70% cocoa, which has a lot more sugar in it than does the 85%, and then gradually move upwards. You can go 85% and above, 90%, even 100% is all fine. 
In effect, we've taken out the processed and carbohydrate rich foods like cakes, breads, pasta, rice that cause damaging increases to our blood glucose. And we've replaced them with foods that contain healthy fats. This is a low carb, healthy fat lifestyle or LCHF. You'll often see that abbreviation or you can look up online about LCHF recipes, for example. Now, can I hear some of you with a bit of silent panic going on here? What about the fats? Won't this be bad for us? And the answer is no, it won't. A low carb, healthy fat diet is rich in healthy fats. And this is the point. And there's no scientific evidence at all that saturated fats cause heart disease. And indeed, healthy fats are essential for our body's vital functions. We'll go into this in much more detail in a later session, but for now, don't be scared of fats. The key word here is healthy. Healthy fats are extra virgin olive oil for salads and dressings, coconut oil, butter, ghee, lard and dripping for cooking. Think back to your mother or grandmother who would almost certainly have cooked with lard and dripping. That's what traditionally we did over hundreds of years. They're not vegetable and seed oils. That is rapeseed oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, um, and all the other vegetable oils, uh, so-called. Also, flora, benicol, and all those spreadable, in inverted commas, butters that have been mixed with vegetable oils to make them softer. These should be avoided as they're damaging to your body. And again, we'll go into why in a later session, but please Rid your kitchen of them as soon as you can, as they're seriously damaging your cells and the way they function, contributing to, if not actually driving, weight gain. So let's put this into practice. Let's think back to breakfasts. What could we eat that would be low in carbs and ideally high in healthy fats? Well, what about bacon and eggs or sausages, provided you look for sausages that have a high meat content at least 95% meat, because remember, everything in a sausage that isn't meat is almost certainly carbohydrate. So the higher the meat percentage, the lower the amount of carbohydrates. But eggs and bacon don't have any carbohydrate to speak of, and so they won't make your blood sugar go up. You could add some mushrooms or a couple of baby tomatoes to that if you wanted, or you could have an omelette or poached eggs, add a bit of grated cheese or ham, or have some poached eggs with spinach, for example. You could make your spinach, drain it well, put a bit of grated cheese on top, and then top that with your poached or fried eggs. Or if you want to be a bit more adventurous, try cracking eggs into avocados and baking them and then putting toppings on like crispy bacon bits or little bits of chopped pepper or grated cheese. There are lots of different ideas and you'll find more ideas in the recipe files in our resources that we're sharing with you. And while we're on the subject of eggs, just look how good they are for you. And don't be concerned that they contain cholesterol. We need cholesterol to absorb vitamins and to build cell walls. In fact, it may surprise you to know that our bodies make 80% of the cholesterol we need. We only get about 20% of what we need from our diet. Does it make sense that your own body would produce something so essential to your well-being, which was at the same time toxic? I don't think so. It doesn't. Eggs are one of the most nutritious foods on the planet. and What's more, they're relatively cheap. So go ahead and enjoy them as many as you want. As you can see from that picture, they're full of vitamin K, omega-3s, vitamin E's, choline, cholesterol. If you want to look at all the detail, just pause the video and then you can uh, read the whole slide. But some of you may not feel like or indeed have time for a cooked breakfast, though arguably it doesn't take long to whip up an omelette. So what about having 100 grams of full fat Greek yogurt instead? Make sure it's full fat, not fat free or low fat, and then add a few red berries and a couple of nuts. You can add these raw or toast them in a hot pan for a few minutes. There's a recipe in the resources for a homemade low carb granola. This is really easy to do and you can make a big batch. It'll keep in an airtight box for weeks and it's a really popular choice, so give it a go. All of these meals contain healthy, natural fats, which will fill you up so you won't get that mid-morning hunger like you probably do now after your cereal and toast. And it won't make you want to reach for the biscuit tin like you probably do now. 
And if you can avoid snacking, going longer between meals, you give your body time to burn off some of your own body fat as as energy instead, helping you to lose weight. And I'll explain why this happens next week. But some of you may not fancy breakfast at all. And if that's the case, then don't have it. Have your morning tea or coffee, black, or put a little double cream in your coffee, or for your tea, maybe a splash of full fat milk or lactose-free milk, which has less, fewer carbohydrates in it than um, uh, semi-skimmed milk, and then have lunch at the normal time. The bottom line, what I'd suggest you do for now is change what you have for breakfast. Cut out the cereals and toast and the fruit juice or bananas and have something else. It can be one of the things we've discussed here or something different or indeed nothing at all. Try not to snack. It can make a big difference to your ability to lose weight. And if you're having a good, healthy breakfast with plenty of fat in it, you shouldn't need to eat till lunchtime. That said, if you're desperate and particularly in the early days, then we have included a list of healthy snacks in the resources folder. If you can, rid the house of biscuits, cakes, crackers, sweets and chocolates, except the dark chocolate with 85% cocoa content, then you can't be tempted. It might feel a little daunting at first as you rethink what foods are healthy and which are not. And that's okay. It'll take some time, but you may be surprised how quickly you can adapt. In the resources folder we've sent you is this handy colour chart. Print it out and stick it on your fridge. It's not perfect and it doesn't contain every single food in the world, of course, but it's a great as a starting point. You can eat as much as you want of the foods in green, a little now and then from the orange list and try and avoid all those in the red list. And again, if you want to pause the video and check it out, but it is in the resources for you to print out. We've talked about breakfast in some detail, but if you'd like a few ideas for other meals in the day, here are just a couple of meal suggestions based on foods from the green list. A homemade burger with a mixed salad or an assortment of vegetables, pan fried salmon with broccoli or other green vegetables, or if you're a vegetarian, a vegetable stir fry with tofu, for example. A nice casserole made with beef, lamb or any other meat, or you could have a bean casserole if you're vegetarian. Don't put too many carrots and onions in. There's a reason onions caramelize when fried. There's a hint in the word, caramel. It's because they have quite a lot of sugar in them. But lots of celery, mushrooms, and any herbs and spices you like. Make it into a curry if you want. Just skip the rice or uh, the potatoes or rice. You can bulk cook a lot, lot of these too and then freeze meal-sized portions. So all you have to do is reheat it. And next time we'll be looking in more detail at lunches and make ahead things that you can take with you if you go out to work, for example. We even have super simple low carb bread recipes to share. And there are lots of easy swaps that you can make. You don't need to ditch everything you've eaten before, unless, of course, you've only ever eaten pizza. Uh, but there are even low carb pizza recipes, and I'll suggest some in a later session. Or you can look for recipes for low carb or keto pizza online. We've given you some recipe sheets, including things like cauliflower rice and celeriac, celeriac which is a fantastic substitute for potatoes. I hope that what we've gone through today, together with the recipes and resources provided, that you'll feel confident in beginning to choose low carb food options and preparing some meals for yourself. But we'll go over this in a future session. So don't worry. And many of you, um, if you, any of you have any questions, you can join our support group, which includes live Zoom sessions and a Facebook group. See the website on how to join in that. Apologies. A couple of things before we wrap up this first session. Carbs are addictive. When we eat them, the same areas of our brain light up as with alcohol and some drugs. And if you suddenly cut them out, your body may crave them, just like any addict craves another fix. Some people, but not all, when they start to cut out carbs, suffer from something called keto flu. Keto is short for ketogenic, which just means very low carb. The symptoms are a bit like a nasty cold or flu, hence the name, and can last for three or four days. But it's not an illness. This is just your body adjusting to the changes and it will pass. Don't think, oh, this diet's not for me. I can't do this and give up. 
You can, and if you persevere, you will come out the other side feeling so much better. But do make sure you drink plenty of water. This is really important, about two litres a day. And your tea and coffee counts towards those two litres. If you would prefer, uh, if you would normally take something for a headache and you get a headache, acetamol, for example, then you can take that. But drink plenty and you may find you need a little more salt than you're used to. So add that to your meals. If you get cramps, particularly in the night, this can be a sign that you need more salt. Or you might think of taking a magnesium supplement, which can also help. Um, you can often find a magnesium spray, which you can spray directly on your legs, for example, if you get cramp in your legs during the night or you get you know, irritable legs, legs, fidgety legs. All these things are quite common and nothing to worry about. Your body is just adjusting to a whole new way of eating. So stick with it and you'll soon feel a lot better. One other important note, if you're taking metformin for diabetes, you can go on taking that as normal. And then hopefully when your HbA1c has come down, you can discuss with your doctor or diabetes nurse the possibility of reducing it. If, however, you're on any other medication, particularly insulin or glycoside or one of the flows in medications, you must discuss reducing this from the outset and not waiting until your HbA1c comes down. Let the doctor or nurse know that you're following the low carb course and they will be able to advise on, re on reducing your medication as soon as you start the course. If you have difficulties and they're not uh, familiar with low carb, then contact us and we can send you um, a copy of a scientific paper that you can hand to your healthcare professional. If you have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes and you've been on insulin for quite a while, more than just a few weeks, it is vital that you do not cut out all the carbs from day one. You must take it more gradually. For example, start by changing your breakfast from cereal or toast to yogurt and berries or eggs, for example. But keep everything else the same as you have been doing. Then after a couple of weeks of doing that, maybe think of cutting out the potatoes or the rice or pasta from your supper three or four times a week and gradually build up. But again, at each stage, continue it for two or three weeks. Just gradually reduce the carbs in your meals over a period of a couple of months or so and check your glucose levels regularly. If the levels drop, then have a conversation with your nurse or GP about reducing your medication. So to sum up, we've looked at how sugar affects our blood glucose levels and why increased blood sugar is bad for our health. We looked at Dr. Unwin's charts and saw carbohydrate and starchy foods also affect our glucose levels in the same way as sugar, which is why we need to avoid them. We've discussed how to replace carbohydrate rich foods with nutrient dense foods with plenty of healthy fats and begun to explore the many food options that are available to us in a low carb real food diet. The most important thing for you to take away from this today is that you can start making changes that will improve your health now and into the future, and that it's okay to start small. Begin with breakfast. Could you swap the toast and jam for an omelette? Could you swap out the cereal and milk for full fat yogurt and berries? Or instead of a burger and chips for dinner, have a burger and salad? Or swap out your regular rice for cauliflower rice? Just start somewhere. You'll feel you start you you'll feel you'll find you'll start to feel better quite quickly, and you'll have more energy and feel more motivated to keep going. Of the sixteen patients who attended the first low carb course I ran with my local uh, surgeries, twelve of them put their type two diabetes in remission. Many people also lost significant amounts of weight, several more than three stone over a three or four month period, and all of them felt so much better. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it too. If I could do it and I'd been overweight my whole life, then anyone can. So next time in the next session, we're going to look at how we got to where we are. We're going to look further at insulin and the role that plays in our diet and the way our bodies work. And we're going to talk about lunches and the options there. So goodbye for now and look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you.